Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our first lecture. We'll be doing uh, chapter four A and B today. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, Mr. Sage. Welcome back. So Denzel, you're doing both classes, huh? Yeah, it's uh, <clears throat> these are the two last things I need to graduate from Cal State. Well, let me know if it starts getting overwhelming. I can give you some help. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Brianna, you look familiar. Were you with me last semester? Yeah. And then uh, somebody who's still, wow, we got a nice full house. That's great. Today may go a little longer than I would normally go because I have to talk about class policy, syllabus, grades, tests, et cetera. And then we're gonna do chapters 4A and 4B today. So we may go a little bit past three, which is my normal my normal end time for this, but I do appreciate y'all showing up. And uh, we'll get started here in just a few minutes, but it looks like uh, there are uh, all the people who are planning on coming are gonna show here. Um, I do uh, I do start class, I'm not start class, but I arrive and I open things up about three, two to three minutes before the actual time. So uh, if you come early and you wanna just chat, that's fine. I'm uh, happy to have you. Oh, this is great. Well, I do have a very large class this semester. So um, I was happy to see you all here. And I hope that this will be worth it for you. I know that this is not the normal way that you do um, that you do uh, an online class, but in my experience, it works far better to have an actual live lecture than uh, just getting the PowerPoints um, posted because there's no interaction. To that effect, I will talk to you guys about how uh, the notes are going to go. If you looked at today's uh, start here, which is the first link under uh, module one. Um, it did say to print out these chapters. And so what you'll be doing is, uh, if you have these chapters printed out, um, you'll need to uh, have them with you. And then uh, as we go through the PowerPoints, you'll be filling in the blanks. When you, if, if you haven't seen it yet, hopefully you will. And then uh, you fill them in. So why do I do it that way? Well, you guys have all had classes where the teacher just slapped a PowerPoint up on the screen, gave you nothing, and then expected you to write everything down. That's stressful because you're spending the whole time scrambling to write as fast as you can. You've also had teachers who have provided you everything and all you were supposed to do is just sit there and take a note here or there once in a while. Boring. My system is set up so that if you follow along, you write a word here and there uh, in the blanks and it kind of keeps you engaged with what, you're, uh, what we're doing. And it still allows you to do the two most important things that you're supposed to be doing in a class like that, which is listening critically and asking questions. So if you find yourself just frantically writing the entire time, uh, let me know. But I want you to be learning as we go as well. So at the end of the lecture, which I probably won't do, but I, if I said, for example, Brianna, can you tell me something that you remembered from today? Or what do you think was the key points of today's lecture? She'd be able to tell me uh, because she pays attention and, and isn't just frantically scribbling and then saying, I have no idea what today's lecture was. I'll figure it out later. Okay, so uh, the way the class is set up, I'll be lecturing on Tuesday and Thursday afternoon from one to approximately three. If you can't come, that's fine. Uh, the, uh, the PowerPoints will be posted under the link that you used to get here today. And you can use that to, to fill in your notes. You won't be able to ask questions, obviously, because you won't be here live. <coughs> uh, I do appreciate you all being here. Um, and to let you know, uh, at the end of these lecture notes are review questions. You might be asking yourself, what are these review questions for? They're usually put in there to prepare you for the exam, but wouldn't it be nice if those review questions were the actual test questions? 
What do you think, Brianna? Are those uh, review questions the actual test questions? Yes, they are. So you're not gonna get that with many instructors. That means I'm providing you all the test questions in advance. Now, before you think that this is gonna be a cakewalk, it's not. There's a lot more questions on, in the review than you'll have on the test and the choices can be very tricky, just to put it mildly. So you do have to actually study as if you were taking this closed book. My recommendation is that you try to take the test as much as you can. Closed book, you're gonna to need to study for it. If you don't study at all for it, it's going to be impossibly difficult because the choices that are offered assume that you know the material and not just looking in your review questions for an answer. So uh, we'll talk more about the tests later, um, extra credit later. But um, so we'll be doing this on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And then I also need to talk to you about Physio X and how that's going to work, how the book works, uh, things like that. So uh, one of the things that you're going to need to do tonight Part of your homework or tomorrow at the very latest is get those review questions done. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be um, on the review day, which is going to be on Thursday afternoon uh, when the first test is, which I believe is next week. Uh, you, we're going to be going over all the review questions and you guys are going to be telling me any that you either couldn't find or were having challenges with or you weren't even sure about your answer. Then I'll make sure that you guys are at least on the right track. Now, there's a couple of things uh, that you'll need to know going into the test. One is that the questions can be very challenging. Now, you will have the questions, uh, the question portion of it in its entirety, and they're the same. But what you won't have are, are the choices, the, the, the options. And these can be very challenging. And the most challenging of which are these two possibilities. Three, all of the answers above are correct. Two of the answers are not above, it's on a paper test, it would be above, but they mix these options on, on Canvas. So two of the answers are right, all the answers are right, or none of the answers are right. So that makes it a little bit more difficult. So when you've been studying it, for example, if a process has two different names or a body part has two different names, those might be two correct answers. So what you're gonna need to do on the test is you're gonna need to slow down and look at all the choices. You don't want to read the question, find something that looks familiar and go, aha, got it, and then answer that, because that'll be wrong often. So what you do is you look at all the choices. Brown is, I, I guess, used to this or talking to somebody else. Um, so what you need to do is look. Is, and then if you see that option for several answers are correct or uh, all these answers are correct, that's usually the right answer. So you might want to note that is that when that option is offered to you, it's almost always right. And the only time that's not the right answer is when the, off, the, question, the uh, choices that are offered are clearly and completely wrong. So for example, on a question, read the question, you really like one of the answers, you really like a second answer, the third one you're kind of on the fence, and the one below it says, all of these answers are correct. Pick that one. Because if that choice is offered 90% of the time, that's the right answer. People often don't pick it because they think, oh, I need to pick the one that looks the most familiar from my notes. But I'm asking you on the day of the test to be able to think critically. Because I've provided you the questions and in for the most part, the answers as well. I wanna say, can you think your way through the test? Or are you just gonna go through in a blind panic or just be doing a matching thing? So that is, that is what I'm gonna expect. Now, I also will tell you, for almost every question, none of these are correct, is an option. Now, how does that work? Well, if none of the options that I'm providing to you are the correct answer or even close, you need to pick none of the above. But here's the key. That's rarely the right answer, maybe 10% of the time max. So if you find yourself going to that option often because you're not seeing the exact answer that you're expecting, you need to go back and re-examine those. Um, generally, I don't add, I don't advocate students going back into a test and changing their answers. But if you find yourself on a test more than five times putting none of the above, a lot of those are gonna be wrong because that's a very rare right answer. All of these are right or two of these are right is a common right answer. None of these are correct, it's very rare. That means nothing in there is even close. But if you see something that's close, that's, that's it, it may not match exactly what you studied, 
but it's close enough. So you need to use your uh, critical thinking skills. Please note that sometimes I will be offering a noun when you studied an adjective. For example, if you studied abdomen and I put abdominal, that's the same thing, okay? So um, what we'll do is we'll go through some of that uh, before the first test and then after the test. What I do for any student who wants to is I'll go through and I'll go through each of the of them, the questions that you missed and talk about why you missed them. What I don't do is I don't provide the, the right answer for everybody who misses them because that basically gives everybody the key to the exam. And that means it could you can provide it to somebody else in the class. So if you wanna go through the ones that you missed with me, we would do that at the end of a lecture during the kind of office hour period at the end of each of my lectures, I devote about 10, 15 minutes to people who wanna to talk to me about anything about their own personal stuff. And the answers you got wrong on the test, it would be qualifying as personal stuff. Okay, so that's how it's gonna work. You take notes, do the review questions, mark the ones you're unsure of. On review day, you ask about them. For example, Brianna would say, I have question 10 on chapter 4A. She would read it, and then she'd come up with the answer that she had. And if she couldn't, we would all discuss it with the right answer. Is. Please remember that what we come up with on review day may, may not match exactly verbatim what it is on the test, but you at least be, you'll be in the ballpark with it. And there may be questions that come up where I say, yeah, that one's not on the test. So that'll help you eliminate some of the questions that you would that otherwise have to study for. Okay, you guys get how the lecture notes and the tests work. Now the test, I will tell you is the only place where you can get extra credit in the class. I do not provide extra credit opportunities, especially at the last minute. I have students frantically trying to bring their 85 up to a 90 at the end, and that's not gonna happen, okay? It's not gonna happen, so just get it out of your head. If you're entering the final with an 85, you're gonna get a B in the class unless something magical happens. I don't provide extra credit assignments at the end. You get little bits of extra credit along the way in the tests, and that's it. Now, many of you, most of you probably heard the story of the tortoise and the hare, right? Which is the, the tortoise and the rabbit, right? Do you guys remember in the story which one wins and why? Come on, you guys have heard the story the before? The tortoise wins, why? Because it moves slowly and steady. Okay, now, in the story called Physiology Summer 2021, do you think the tortoise is gonna win that race? Probably not. Think the hare is going to win that race? Negative. No, there's a third animal in the story, and his name is the badger. Okay? You guys ever seen a badger run? They're not real fast, are they? But they're faster than a turtle, and they're slower than a rabbit. So I, to, to make an analogy a little bit labored, I need you guys to be a badger in this class. And that is don't go slow because you won't be able to keep up. Don't assume like the rabbit, you can sprint ahead on a Sunday night and get everything done or sprint ahead at the end of a class and somehow get a whole bunch of points back. You have to be like the badger, you know, trotting along nice and a medium speed. Is it possible for the badger to take a rest once in a while or have an off day? Sure, you can have an off day. You can even have an off week but you gotta keep rolling. You can't go slow and steady and you can't sprint and nap. You have to go nice and solidly through. So what that means is at the end of the semester, if you're in the low Bs, you're not gonna get an A in the class and there's nothing you can do. Please don't beg me by the way for a higher score because you gotta have an A. You're not gonna get an A unless you earn an A. Now I will tell you about how my grading is set up. My girlfriend's daughter is in a nursing program. She got an 89.8 at the end, and the instructor gave her a B. That's pretty harsh, isn't it? Only by one or two one hundredths of a percentage point. Now, I'm going to tell you what I do. I round off to the nearest digit. So, for example, in my class, you would have gotten an A. So, if you get 89.5 or higher, you'll get an A because that rounds off to 90. What you don't want to do because it's obnoxious and awful, is say, hey, Mr. Sage, I got an 88.6, and that rounds off to 89, and that's only one point away from an A, so can I have an A, please? That's not going to happen. You guys know how to round, right? Round off to the nearest digit, so if it rounds to the next number, you get it, 
but one percentage point is not one point. That's like a whole assignment that you didn't do. So if you end up with a rounded off to an 89, a rounded off to an 88, you're gonna get a B. Please don't beg. Please don't frantically go back through and see if you can dig up some points from the past. That's not how this works. And it's and it's it has bad form. It makes me not want to write letters of reference for my students. So if you guys get through this well and you don't act too much of a pain in the neck, I'll be happy to write you a letter of reference when you're done. Because if you get through this class with an A or B or even a C, and you do it in a way that doesn't get under my skin, it shows good character. And I write letters of reference for students who have good character, not necessarily only for the highest grades. As a matter of fact, since most of you are probably going to nursing, there's this, there's this horrible thing that I hear all the time and when people talk to me about grades and students and pre-nursing, et cetera. Um, they say, I would never want to have a doctor or a nurse working on me who didn't get straight A's. I think that is the biggest load of bull I've ever heard in my life. Do you guys know what makes a good healthcare provider? Is it getting perfect grades? Is that what makes a good healthcare provider, in your opinion? What does? Do they need to be knowledgeable, basically knowledgeable? Tracy, what do you think? I think basically that they can make mistakes and then learn from them. And the more that they learn from their mistakes, they're going to be better providers. Yeah, and Tiffany says in, in the discussion, compassion and dedication to learn. That's what makes a good healthcare provider, in my opinion, not just someone who gets straight A's. That's why I don't care whether you got an A or B or even a C, because this class is going to be hard. It's going to be a lot of work. You show your character by how you trot along like a badger through the class, maintaining a good attitude, because you guys have a long way to go, right? You guys have a long way to go. You have your pre-nursing classes or your pre-allied health classes. Then you got to get into the program and then you got to wait until it starts and then you got to get all the way through it. Then you finally get your golden chalice, which is your job, right? And even that's not going to be great, maybe. But uh, the key is consistency and good attitude, right? And that's what I reward with good letters of reference. Now, what I don't do in this class is I don't give a subjective score based on how much you kiss my backside. That's not what I'm interested in. And I'm not going to give you a better letter of reference just because you told me what an awesome teacher I am. Now, I would like it if you felt that way. I've got a few students in here who have had me, and maybe you can talk to them. Sydney, Brianna, who else has been in here? Delia, oh. Brianna, I, Carissa, I want to say, Tanisha. I got a bunch of returning students, Denzel. Anyway. Hopefully they will tell you I'm a good teacher, but I don't need you to, to butter my muffin continuously in order to do well in the class, okay? So that's that. Now, Physio X and the book. Uh, I don't know how clear I made it. I probably didn't make it super clear, but uh, you have a couple of options for what you wanna do for access for the laboratory portion for this and for the textbook. Now, if you wanna get a paper textbook, which some students actually prefer, you can get any recent edition of Silverthorne's Human Physiology. Um, doesn't have to be the most recent edition. As a matter of fact, my notes are based on a fairly, not old, but not super up-to-date edition. Now, I'm sure you guys imagine that human physiology doesn't change that much in the span of 10 years. So uh, any differences between those editions shouldn't be significant. Um, so what you, you can, if you get a paper book, then you're still going to have to go to the MyLab and Mastering and order the uh, Physio X access um, on your own. Uh, there is a cost associated with that, and you guys are used to paying book costs, right? I know some teachers do the open stacks, and I would love to, but I've never found one that works well. So uh, you have two options. You can either go in there just for the Physio X and not buy the book. Or you can go in there and get the digital version of the text with the Physio X. They bundle it together, saving you money. That's what I recommend, but you guys have your choice. I'm not going to penalize you if you don't buy a book. Second of all, my tests are based solely on my lectures, the lecture notes, and the review questions. So I will not be saying, hey, I know I lectured on part of chapter one, but the rest of that's on you. You need to read the whole book, and then uh, I'll pull questions randomly from my backside and make you figure it out. I don't do that. So it's up to you what you want to purchase, but you do have to pay for it. 
at least the Physio X, and I need you guys to do that as soon as possible. If you're like, hey, Mr. Sage, I don't get paid for a couple of weeks, you need to reconsider taking the class because you guys need to jump into Physio X uh, immediately, if not sooner, as my dad used to say, in the next couple of days. You got to buy access, you got to get in there and start working, especially activity uh, exercise. The exercise is the lab and then the activities are within the lab. The first lab has a lot of activities and they can be rather complicated. So one of the things I'm also gonna be doing with the end of my lectures is say, does anybody have any questions about the physio exit you've been working on? What does MWCO mean? And what's the significance of that? It's a big part of your very first lab. So you guys need to get in there and start working. on it. So what's gonna happen is there's no lab report for you to do. You would have to do that if you were taking it live with me on campus. But what you'll do is you'll just type all of your answers right into that into that program. And, uh, and I will grade them in there and then move the scores over at the end of the week. I generally don't go in and pre-grade unless you request it. Uh, and I certainly don't move scores over from uh, the Pearson My Lab and Mastering into your grade book until Monday because everything's due on Sunday. Now, I don't know how much of a vibe you got from me about procrastination, but it is the killer, the worst possible thing that you can do. And one of the people who was very good at not doing that was Sydney. Sydney was always very good in my anatomy class at staying on top of things. She's also really good at asking hard questions, which isn't bad. It's actually good. Uh, it keeps me honest. But uh, do like she did in anatomy and stay on top of it. Don't wait until the end. You got to badger it week by week even. And what that means is don't plan on doing anything on Sunday except resting. Everybody hear me? Don't plan on doing anything on Sunday for this class except resting. Now, what is Sunday for? Sunday is for if on Friday or Saturday, you're like, oh, crap, I didn't get X done because I had this real big emergency happen in my life. And now I need Sunday to get it done. If you put work in Sunday and something happens, it's late and I don't accept late work. So please make the soft due date Saturday night get everything in Saturday night, and then use Sunday only for uh, stuff that emergencies, okay? And then that way you don't have to beg for an extension. I only give extensions in the most dire circumstances. For example, if you're in the hospital or you were in an accident or something really serious. Uh, Mr. Sage, I got busy with work and I didn't get any of the work done. And then my computer broke on Saturday night and I couldn't get it fixed until Monday. Well, those will be dropped as your lowest score. I didn't talk about that, did I? Your lowest Physio X score and your lowest test will automatically be dropped if Canvas determines that by dropping it, it would improve your score. Now, some students say, Mr. Sage, uh, Canvas never dropped my lowest Physio X. And I would say, what is your lowest score? And they'd say, well, 27 out of 30. Well, that's not going to help you by dropping. It's going to hurt you. So Canvas only drops your lowest test and Physio X if they would add fat dropping would actually improve your score. The only exception to that is the final, which is not dropped. Now about the final, uh, the final is just a regular test like all the rest of them, but because it is the final, it is not dropped. So it's not cumulative or semi-cumulative, it's just a regular test, three or four chapters, it shouldn't be too stressful. In addition, I don't have a class project in this class because I always found those as kind of tedious and awful to write, and I've also found them tedious and awful to read. So to find out if you can write, you have two places. One is in the Physio X where it asks you, why did this molecular weight cutoff not allow the protein free? And if you say, cause you don't get points on it, I want you to explain. And if you're like, well, it makes sense to me. Like, what would a teacher want to hear? How much detail would that teacher want if that's the only way that they get to find out you get this. So give me lots of details. Now, if it says what was the largest molecule it was able to diffuse, and you say sodium chloride, that's right. You don't need to explain that, right? But if it says why did that happen, or explain, or describe, or anything that sounds like you should be writing lots of sentences, write lots of sentences. Short answers often get partial credit, and those partial credit dings can hurt you in the long run. Um, approximately two thirds, I, I'm sorry. Approximately 60% of the, of the score is the uh, in-lab stuff that you do, and then about 40% is the questions at the end. 
where you type an answer. So be detailed on that. The other place that I ask you for a writing is on the test. Now, you guys, I don't know if you know, but physiology is all about how processes in the body work. How, do you, how does your liver work? How does your stomach work? How do, how do, how do hormones work? Well, I'm going to be asking you to describe it in detail and to organize your thoughts. So what's going to happen is you will be given a figure that shows a process occurring. And what I'm going to ask you to do is in the first sentence to summarize the entire figure without making it a run-on. And you guys know how run-on sentences work, where you say something, you say, and then, and then, and then, and you just keep clipping things together until it turns into this monster sentence. I want you to summarize the entire figure in one detailed sentence. It's the most difficult thing I'm going to ask you to do for the whole semester. But that's how you start your essays. And then you go through all the process, giving me plenty of detail, and you're good to go. I'll also be providing you those essays in advance. Usually they're the figures that are in your lecture notes. But on the day of the review or the day before, probably on Tuesday of next week, I will actually show you the essay portion of the exam, the actual exam, and allow you to see exactly what uh, I'll be asking on the test. So what you're going to need to do is you're going to need to work on those essays in advance in a word processor. And then on the day of the test, copy your answer and paste. That is your answer, not somebody else's. If I suspect plagiarism from another site, I will do a search. And if it still sounds really weird, I'll ask you to explain it during lecture. And if you can't, you don't get credit for it. So please write them yourself with plenty of detail. If you're like, oh, I'll just find something online. You will absolutely not just get a zero for that, for that answer. You'll get a zero for the entire test. In some places, you can get thrown out of school for doing that. Don't plagiarize, especially on exam essays. Can you, Brianna, Sydney, can you send me your essays in advance and have me check them out? Yeah, you can. So if you write an essay and you're like, hey, Mr. Sage, is this good enough? And you want to send it to me, please send it as inline text in the email or as a PDF or Word document, I don't accept pages or Google Docs because they don't work for me. Now, I will tell you, if your inclination is to send me your essay because you want to make sure it's perfect, guess what is probably really good? Every student who ever sends me their essay in advance gets at least a four if they don't change it at all. Four out of five, five being the highest possible score in an essay. So if your inclination is to send me your essay, hey, Rest assured, it's probably a really good one. The people who should send me their essays are the ones who don't. Those are the ones who haven't prepared. What you don't want to do on the day of the test is write the essay for the first time while you're staring at the test. Why? Because you have a lot of questions, multiple choice, and you have the essays. The essay should take you no more than about a minute or two as you copy your answers from your word processing document and paste them into the test. That is your answers, not somebody else's. Okay, those are the ways that I find out can you write. So there is no project at the end. Plus, what should you be doing the last week of class? What should you be preparing for the last week? Final exam. Final exam. Plus, you have final exams in other classes. Like there's this anatomy teacher I heard about who's really tough, who teaches just like I do, uh, same day, but 10 a.m. So if you're taking both classes, yeah, I don't give projects in either one. So it's kind of relaxed, but the finals are always hectic, right, and hellish. So um, that's why I don't do projects. OK, so what else did I want to talk about? I talked about extra credit. The extra credit is found as uh, additional essays. Usually at the end of the test, it would be a separate section. It's worth zero points. And what that means is if you don't do it, it doesn't cost you anything, but I give you points out of zero. And that can boost your overall score. Um, but uh, it's still the, the test uh, canvas will still consider the entire score and drop it or not. Now, I will tell you that uh, at one point when I was putting these, get these things together, test five, I wasn't able to get the images into Canvas. So if you see a test where there's a multiple choice test and an essay test, they come in as two separate exams and two separate scores, but they're considered one. Um, I don't know exactly how dropping is going to work with that, but it's still one test, but it's separated into two separate. And you can take them at different times. That comes up towards the end of the semester. Um, and we'll, we'll discuss that when we get closer. 
So that's essays, that's extra credit. I talked about basic strategies. Uh, Physio X takes a lot of time. None of it's really hard, but you just got to get started with it and get working on it and ask questions if you have them. <clears throat> okay, so what else did I want to talk about? I talked about Physio X. You have no lab reports to turn in. Um, we have discussion boards, right? We won't have them throughout the whole semester. I do them at the beginning to satisfy anybody who's coming in and looking. But mostly they're just to, you know, because it's an online class. Uh, so we won't be doing them through the whole semester. And then I grade those on Monday as well. So the grade update happens Monday. I grade everything on Monday. I import it into Canvas. And then you should know uh, at any time. By the way, if you're really desperate to know what your grade is with the most recent Physio X score or with a recent uh, discussion, I'll grade it in advance for you, especially if you uh, send me an email and request it. Are there any questions about anything that I've talked about so far or anything else that's coming up in the class before we start chapter 4A? Okay, well, if you do have them, uh, you can talk to my former students. They will tell you that not only do I allow questions during lecture, I encourage and require them. Please do not leave here saying, oh, I really felt like I should have asked him a question, but I didn't because I was bashful. Don't be bashful. It's not going to get you where you want. So please interrupt me if you want during the lecture. You can either wave your hand, you can say something verbally, and I'll be happy to clarify right in the middle of the lecture. At the end, we'll have time for office hours. If you want to, by the way, I turn off the recording of the video, which we are recording now, and, uh, and talk to you one-on-one -on -one as if you were in my office. Okay, if there are no questions, then I'm going to go ahead and begin. If you're curious why we're not beginning with chapter one, those are all the concepts, chapters one through three, that you should know coming into this class. Now, there isn't a prerequisite for this class, which I am not thrilled about. It wasn't up to me. But I'm going to proceed up to chapter four, assuming you've had some basic biology and or chemistry. If you guys haven't had any science before in this class, before this class, this is your very first science class in your entire life. This is going to be a hard class. This is going to be a really hard class. But if you do have some biology, some chemistry, some general science, uh, you should be fine. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen. And then uh, as we go through, if I'm going too quickly, let me know. But remember also that this lecture is being recorded and will be available uh, to watch at a later date if you miss something or just want to watch it again more slowly. For example, I'll be going through the, the figures and descri describing them. And you don't have to write everything out really, really fast. You can just say, hey, on that part, I'm going to go back and rewatch it and pause, write some stuff, watch it, pause. And then you can just take as much time as you want to take notes on the figures and the processes that are likely to be essays on the test. OK, so uh, stop me if I go too fast, but otherwise uh, watch it later. Oh, last thing I want to say is, uh, the recordings aren't usually available immediately after class because it takes 10, 20, 30 minutes for Zoom to process the recordings. So uh, if, you if you don't see a recording, if you miss and you don't see the recording available uh, the next day, just send me a reminder and I'll, I'll get in there and I'll link uh, the video, which is on Zoom, to my class and so you can watch it. Okay, here we go. We're going to start with Chapter 4A. Okay, and here we go. All right. We're going to go to cellular metabolism because that's really uh, the, the key to what we, uh, what we talk about in here. The other stuff had to do with atoms and molecules and stuff that you kind of should already know. Anyway, so here we are in your notes. And what you want to do is fill in the blanks from what you see. Energy in the form of ATP does work, and that's in the body. If something's going to happen actively, it requires energy. 99% of the time, it's ATP that gets burned up doing it. Chemical work is the ability to synthesize new molecules or break down large molecules. These are called catabolism and anabolism. We're going to get to that later. Chemical work that usually requires energy, especially the building of large molecules requires energy. Transport work is the ability to move molecules across membrane and with uh, around within cells. Normally, uh, when we get to, especially when we get to the sodium potassium pump, you'll see that by moving things across membranes, generally, uh, you only have to use energy if you're moving it against the gradient. Now, if you guys don't know what a gradient is, we'll be talking about that later. Basically, against 
the direction it wants to go. Mechanical work is moving flagella or muscle cells, physically changing the shape of a cell or a cell organelle. We're going to get to the analogy of a wheelbarrow and talk about this figure here. This figure, by the way, is not going to be on your exam if you see it in your notes. Does anybody need a moment more with this uh, slide? If you don't speak up, I'm going to move on. Okay. This is a figure that shows kind of overall how energy moves through an ecosystem. But since we're not studying ecology, not very helpful. So we're just going to go. second. What was that? Can you go back for one second? To this one? Okay. And yes, you're welcome to take pictures so that you, uh, uh, you guys remember the expression, why don't you take a picture it'll last longer? All right. Uh, so you're welcome to do that or you're welcome to rewatch later. Okay, so chemical reactions. If you have had some chemistry, you'll recognize these symbols. These two on the left are called reactants. The arrow means something is happening in terms of a chemical reaction, and C and D are the products. So A and B just are symbols to represent uh, chemicals, usually in the form of formulas that are uh, in, the, in this reaction, chemical reaction. C and D are the products. So they're called reactants because they react with each other to yield the products. The arrow symbol indicates a chemical reaction has occurred. Now, unlike math, uh, one plus one equals two is just as valid to say two equals one plus one, but you can't reverse this arrow and have it be true. This is be, what it means is this, this is before, this is during, and this is after. There's a time component of chemical reactions that's not in that. What are some types of chemical reactions? A plus B turning into C is called a combination reaction. We're going to see some of those in this class. C turning into A plus B is called decomposition, breakdown. L plus MX turns into M plus LX, single displacement, because you can see they change partners. And then the bottom here is double displacement, means both partners are exchanged. Usually the cation and anion are exchanged here. or the metal and the salt, et cetera. So this is just a quick review or introduction to some ways that you'll see chemical reaction. And we move away from this pretty quickly, but it is good to have a quick review or introduction to it if you haven't gotten it. Uh, would anybody like a moment more with this slide? By the way, if you are on video, Transfer overview slide. Um, if it's that far back, uh, rewatch the video. I'm, I'm not going to go backwards uh, more than just the slide that we were just on. Okay. So yeah. So if if uh, if that's the case, <laughs> you don't have to sir me, but if, if if that makes you feel better, that's fine. Yeah. So uh, for example, like if if I went to this next slide and somebody said, "Oh, can you go back?" and I'm here, that's fine. But if we're going back to a much previous slide, I'll have you rewatch. Okay, energy and chemical reactions. The reason why I'm kind of moving through this quickly is because we have a lot of material to cover in a certain amount of time, and I don't want to keep you guys past three if I can. All right, there's two basic types of chemical reactions based on energy released. The first is called endergonic. Ender as an endo means energy is going into this process, and it means energy is being stored. So in the case of photosynthesis, plants are storing sunlight energy in their food. So that becomes an endergonic reaction. Same thing happens when you store starch in your liver after you eat food, that's an endergonic because you're building a larger molecule of a smaller one. In extergonic, it's the reverse. Energy is released from chemical bonds. You're breaking chemical bonds, taking large molecules in the smaller. ATP being used for cellular work is a good example of that, or the breakdown of sugar during glycolysis and the rest of cellular respiration, which is much of what today's lecture is all about. Would anybody like a moment more with this slide? Speak now or forever hold your peace. Okay, this is not a great uh, figure, but it is in your text. 
it just shows uh, how the different way that energy is used in the body. We're going to find better figures later on. So it's just there, but it's not great. Now, this is a picture I've, I have from a very old textbook, but it works great. We're going to be talking about enzymes here because enzymes are a really important part of how body's chemistry works. So this is a representation of an enzyme. It looks kind of blobby. And the substrate is the thing that's going to be changed by the enzyme. Uh -huh. You need to mute Sydney. <laughs> and so then they combine together, you get an enzyme substrate complex. And what happens is often this substrate is broken down into the end products and released. Notice that the enzyme is the same at the end as it was at the beginning. So what are enzymes? They are protein catalysts. Now, what does a catalyst mean? A catalyst is a chemical that causes a chemical reaction to happen that doesn't change itself. They're usually named for what they do. Notice the ASE at the end. Uh, do they have this name? No, they don't. So when you when you look at this, when you look at almost any enzyme, you're going to see that ASE ending. Now there are some exceptions to that. For example, pepsin and trypsin in the stomach and the small intestine don't have that ASE ending. But generally, ASE means uh, enzyme. Now, OSE, as in glucose and fructose, anybody have a guess what those molecules would be? Glucose, fructose, sucrose, what would you call those? Sugar. Sugars, right. So sugars have the OSE, even starches have that, and then enzymes have the ASE. So here we go. Catalyst is a molecule that causes a chemical reaction to occur, but does not change itself in the process. You have a thing in your car, if you drive a gasoline-powered car, called a catalytic converter. It contains rare metals that help convert the unburned gasoline into fully burned exhaust. But it doesn't change in itself, and that's why you don't have to replace it. Although people have been stealing them lately, which is, I mean, yeah. Anyway, the active side of an enzyme is the same shape as some part of the substrate that it changes. And you can see that the active site here is kind of like the glove, the substrate is the hand, and they fit together perfect. Question. What do you think would happen if you changed the shape of this active site? Would this be able to go all the way to the end if you change the shape? What do you think, guys? If this changed the shape, could they still fit together? Nope. What if you put something else in here besides the substrate? Could the substrate fit in? Nope. So this is a couple of ways that enzymes are prevented from doing their work is the active site has changed, or something else fits into the active site blocking the substrate. Okay, so enzymes lower activation energy. Now, what is activation energy? Well, you guys know that it takes a certain amount of heat to cause gasoline to explode, right? And that comes from the spark in your engine or a flame. Now, obviously, if you want to burn sugar, you would have to put it into a really, really hot oven or into a fire. But you can burn sugar at body temperature, which is only 37 degrees. You guys probably think of it as 98.6. By the way, are you guys aware that the United States is the only place in the world that still uses non-metric? And why? Is it because we're special or stubborn? Tracy, you have to push your space bar. It's stubborn. Stubborn, <laughs> right. American exceptionalism. We are better than everybody else, so we don't have to play like they play. But scientists use the uh, use Celsius and metric because we share information with each other and other places, which also have valuable things to say besides just us. All right, uh, what is activation energy? It means the amount of energy that you have to put into a chemical reaction to cause it to go. Normally, you would have to make sugar very, very hot to burn it, but you can do so at body temperature if you have enzymes. And it allows these chemical reactions to happen very quickly. It may cause over 10,000 chemical reactions to happen in just one second. Why so fast? Is because it's a very, very small scale. Things happen very quickly in very small places. It takes twice as long to walk over a much larger area than a smaller area. And if you keep compressing the space down, you also compress the time or increase the velocity. Enzymes may need to be activated. They may not be in their active form, so they're going to need something to activate them. Ariel, yes, I didn't catch that, but maybe it wasn't for me. All right, uh, enzymes may need to be activated. 
Enzymes involved in blood clotting and digestion need to be activated. So when you see the OGEN, like pepsin OGEN, that means it's an inactivated enzyme that needs to be activated. By the way, pepsin OGEN is activated by stomach acid. So it doesn't become active until after it gets into the stomach. So when you see that OGEN ending, it means it can be turned on and do its work. So this is not an essay, it's more like a check your understanding. Why do you think it's important that many enzymes don't float around in their active state? Well, would you carry a loaded gun in your car with the safety off? Would you ship bombs from a bomb factory that were armed? No. So why would you have these enzymes be inactivated? Well, it's because you don't want them doing what they're supposed to do until they're in the exact right place and situation where they need to work because they could affect the chemistry of the cell that produced them if they were made in their active form. And they only should work where they're supposed to. Some enzymes require cofactor or coenzymes. And often one of the reasons why we need vitamins is because these vitamins can act as cofactors, coenzymes, allowing the enzymes to do their job. Many of you may have noticed that vitamin B, the, the vitamin, the B vitamins can give you more energy. Part of that is because these, uh, these vitamins help activate some of the enzymes involved in cellular respiration. Cellular respiration produces ATP energy. So when you take vitamins, it's going to give you more energy. Um, by the way, uh, vitamins are best found in healthy foods, not in pills, but pills are better than nothing. Junk food is the worst. Twinkies, don't eat Twinkies. All right, uh, off we go. Did anybody need more time on the previous? Okay, uh, by the way, what the uh, format, and Sydney knows this, of uh, requesting more time is that when you're done, you have to say something because we're all here. Sydney's ready, okay. Modulators, okay. Now, let me ask you a question. Do most of you guys have a freezer that produces ice? Makes ice. Okay. So the question I have for you is, does, uh, does your ice machine make fresh ice 24 hours a day or does it stop sometimes? It stops. When does it stop? When does your ice maker stop? When it gets to a certain line. Right. When it fills. Right? The sensor. Yeah. And when does your ice machine start making ice again? When it's below that sensor. Right. When you take some out. Do you think your human body is similar to that? To your body is similar to that? Yeah, it is. Enzymes are not supposed to be churning away full speed 24 hours a day. They're only supposed to be going until you have as much as you're supposed to have. One of the key words that we haven't gotten to yet in this class is called homeostasis. And if I, if, if I asked you what one word describes most of physiology, that's it. Homeostasis means having just the right amount of everything in your body, not too much, not too little. And if you go away from that, that ideal, your body kicks in and gets you right back to where you're supposed to be, a nice full ice bucket. So enzymes can be turned on and turned off so that they produce just the right amount of product so that your body has just what it needs. If you change the ideal conditions, it can slow or stop the enzyme function. And there's several ways this can happen. These can be problems, or these can be normal ways that your enzymes work. When are some modulators? Modulators mean modifiers, modifiers of the rate. Temperature. Now, does anybody know why sugar dissolves faster in hot coffee versus cold iced tea? Anybody know why it doesn't take very long in hot coffee to dissolve sugar a lot longer in iced tea? Because the molecules are moving faster? Very good. Molecules are moving more quickly. So as you increase the temperature of any chemical reaction, it's going to go faster. But you guys have heard of people dying of fever, right? Heat stroke? Why? Because the enzymes get broken. And we're going to be talking about how enzymes get broken or denatured here in just a little bit. So temperature can increase or decrease the rate of these. pH, I don't know if you guys have any experience with this. This is how acid 
or base a solution is. And that's one of the things that I could have covered in a previous chapter, but I'm hoping you guys know what acidity means in a general sense. Inhibitors, we're gonna talk about inhibitors that are poisons and inhibitors that your body naturally produces to slow enzymes down when you have as much as you need of their product. Would anybody like a moment more with this slide? And by the way, Sydney had an advantage earlier because she just went like this, just gave me like a little signal. She didn't have to say anything and it helps me know where you are in this note-taking process if you're on camera. So if, if you're inclined, please do so. It helps me see what you're doing. All right, so the ideal temperature for any enzyme is specific to that enzyme. Most body enzymes prefer 98.6, which we would say, or 37, which is cells. Now, interestingly, there are some cells that actually prefer slightly cooler than body temperatures. And I will tell you, they develop outside, kind of on the outside of the body that produced it. Anybody happen to know what body cells found in only one gender, by the way? Actually like temperatures a little bit. What's that? What was the temperature that you said? Uh, 98.6 or 37 is what normal body temperature is. But there are some cells in the body that like it slightly cooler than that. And they're only produced in one of the genders, so you guys can probably figure it out. What cells in, in one gender are produced kind of on the outside of the body? Sperm. Sperm cells, very good. So sperm cells get too warm, they won't function properly. Um, now, they function great once they're inside the woman's body, but when they're developing the man's body, they need to be on the outside. That's why they're not produced inside. All right. Anyway, if the enzyme is too cold, it moves too slowly and does not cause as many chemical reactions to occur. And this is why you die from freezing to death. Your enzymes are moving too slowly. You can't produce enough energy, and you die from lack of energy. So in the same way that sugar takes long, longer to dissolve in iced tea, all chemical reactions move more slowly when they're in the cold. When you warm them up, they go faster, but only up to a certain point. If you overheat them, what happens is you start to kill these enzymes, which are responsible for maintaining you being alive, and destroy them, basically. Change the shape of the active site. If the active site can't combine with the substrate, you can't make the things that you need and you will start dying. And this is what happens with heat stroke or fever. You are overheating your body and you're killing, to use the colloquial term, your enzyme. Now, when you've permanently changed the shape of the active side of the enzyme, it's called denature. And that means it's been destroyed. Good example of denaturing a protein is cooking uh, an egg. You guys have all cooked eggs on the stove before, right? What color is the white of a raw egg? Clear. 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 And what color is the white when it's cooked? White. White. Why does it change color? It's because the proteins change shape. It means they've been denatured. Now, is there any way to uncook an egg? There is. And you guys aren't going to like the answer. It's a riddle. But the way that you uncook an egg is... You chop the cooked egg up and you feed it to a chicken. How does that uncook the egg? Okay, I'll tell you. They digest the egg, break it all the way back down to the amino acids and make a new egg. So that's what happens in your body when you denature enzymes. Your body has to break that enzyme all the way down to the amino acids and then make a new one. Okay. Yeah, most people don't feed chickens their own eggs, but you know, whatever. All right, pH affects enzyme activity. Acidity can affect enzyme activity. By the way, do you guys know why I tell uh, dorky dad jokes? Anybody have a guess? It helps you remember it. Yeah, but uh, you're right. But do you guys, you guys ever had a class that you hated before? Do you remember how much actual content from that class you still remember after the class you really hated? Very little. And we're not talking about anatomy, are we, Sydney? 
because she had it with me. Um, very little. And one of the reasons why you hate classes is because they're unpleasant. And one of the reasons why you can't remember it is you're stressed. But when you laugh, you guys know what happens to your stress level when you laugh, even at dorky dad jokes. What happens to stress levels? They go down and you're able to learn and remember more. And it's more fun for everybody, especially me who gets to tell the awful jokes, right? But the key is that's why you're going to hear me telling jokes from time to time, because it'll actually help you uh, learn, help you remember, and it makes for a much more pleasant summer rather than, you guys have got teachers who take their, their subject way too seriously, right? They think that what they're teaching is like the most important thing in the whole world. Nothing that I teach is the most important thing in the whole world, right? It's just a class. You need to know this stuff, but it's not that important. It's a class. Anyway, let's keep moving. All right, all enzymes have an ideal pH at which they best function. They like a certain level of acid. What do you think is the acid preference for enzymes in your stomach? Neutral or acidic? What would you guess? Acidic? Acidic because your stomach is full of acid, right? Turns out that's exactly the case. Changing an enzyme's pH causes changes in the shape of the enzyme's active site. That can either be towards too basic or too acid. Either way can cause changes to the active site and completely destroy the enzyme. And then your body has to completely recycle it back down into its constituent amino acid parts. So this is uh, one of the reasons why you have stomach acid. So here's one of the big, the two main reasons why you have stomach acid is bacteria and viruses are made out of proteins. When they hit that acid, their enzymes denature, their proteins denature, it kills them. In addition, the acid in your stomach also causes the complex protein structure of meats and other proteins to unfold, allowing the enzymes to get in and break them down into amino acids so that you can get that nutrition. But either acid or base can do this, um, cause the uh, problem. So here's a figure that um, I don't know is going to be on the test. You guys have this figure in your notes, right? <clears throat> it may be on the test. It may be on the test. So this may be one of the ones that you're going to want to re-watch re me describe if this ends up on the test. I can't right off the top of my head remember if this is one of the essays, but let's treat it as if it were. It's kind of uh, core to your understanding how enzymes work, especially in different pHs. Okay. So remember I told you that there are a couple of enzymes in your body that uh, don't have the ASC ending. Here's one of them, pepsin and trypsin. Part of the reason why they're given those names is because they begin their life with the ogen uh, suff uh, yeah, suffix. So this would be pepsinogen in its inactivated form and trypsinogen in its inactive form. These are the active forms. Human amylase doesn't need to be activated, so it has the ASC. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to describe a bite of food, let's say a hamburger. <clears throat> a bite of hamburger because it has both starch and protein in it. First of all, I'm going to describe how this figure works, and then I'm going to describe what happens as you eat a piece of hamburger, a bite of hamburger. Okay, you guys know the difference between X and Y axis? X is along here, left to right. Y is up and down. And what it means is the height of the line is telling you how active the enzyme is, how fast it's moving, how many chemical reactions it's facilitating. So you can see pepsin here likes right around two, Amylase likes around seven and trypsin likes around eight. Okay, so let's start with a bite of hamburger. Where does that bite of hamburger begin anatomically? When you eat it. Start at the beginning. You have to participate or I won't move on. Where does that bite begin? Uh, seven. Math. In your mouth. Very good. First graders can get that one, right? Oral cavity. Someone's being fancy. Good job. Okay, so where are we if we're in the mouth? We're over here at seven. Your saliva is neutral, seven. And there's human amylase. It means starch digesting sub, uh, enzyme. Now, which part of the burger is starchy? The bun or the patty? The bun. 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 Okay. So it is the bun. Good job, Lucas. 
And so what it does is this human amylase has two functions. One is it helps uh, break down the starch in your mouth so that it'll taste sweet, which is an indicator to you that it is full of good energy. And secondly, you guys ever finish eating a starchy meal, your teeth are covered with starch. And what it does is it helps dissolve that starch and prevent bacteria from getting hold of it, and using it to, uh, to make a cavity. So it actually washes your teeth. So you're here, it's human amylase. It likes a neutral pH, which is great because your saliva is neutral. So now you swallow it. Where does that bite of burger go next? Anybody who's had anatomy, and I happen esophagus. to know, Sydney knows, esophagus, okay. And then after that. Into the stomach. Your stomach, okay. Now, if you had to guess which of these enzymes, good job, Maribel. Uh, if you had to guess which of these enzymes works in the stomach, which one would you say? You gotta look at the figure and look at the things on the bottom. Would it be pepsin or trypsin or why? Yeah, pepsin because that's where the acid is. Right, your stomach is full of acid, right. So here's the deal, check it out. Pepsin only works, uh, close enough. You don't, you don't have to worry about spelling in these chats, just get it out quickly. All right, pepsin only works in very acidic environments. If you get it too basic, or, I mean too acid on this side or too basic on this side, it won't work. The pink bar says this is its happy pH, the pH that it prefers. Now notice how far it is away. Amylase, the enzyme that you swallowed from your saliva, got completely denatured because you can see that line is dropping down to zero. As soon as the, the line goes down to zero, enzymes destroyed and can't be used. So pepsin kicks in your stomach. Now, anatomy students, what where does the food go after your stomach? Intestines. Intestines. Now what's left? It's the last Waste. enzyme left in this figure. Come on, guys. It's the last enzyme. The trypsin? Tri trypsin. Trypsin. Oh, trippy. Oh, it's trippy, right? Trypsin. This likes slightly alkaline, slightly basic. Now, why is that? Is because the material that's coming in is there to neutralize the acid from the stomach. So trypsin likes it slightly uh, basic. So the idea here is when you eat food, it goes from neutral to way acid and then way back to, to slightly basic. And that big fluctuation is supposed to kill everything in your food because every single bite of food that you ever swallow is full of bacteria. Why? Because your mouth is full of bacteria. Why? Because bacteria are always in your mouth, no matter how much uh, Listerine you gargle, the bacteria will be back within a few minutes. So it, that's, and remember the pepsin, it only works in acidic, environments because the uh, enzyme, the protein unfolds and the pepsin can go to work breaking it up into amino acids. So if I asked you to summarize this whole thing in one sentence, could you do it? This is the most difficult part of the whole class. I'm telling you guys right now, the most difficult thing I'm ever gonna ask you to do in this class besides badgering your way through is putting a first sentence that's got plenty of detail that's not a run -off. This figure shows how different enzymes in the digestive tract each have their own ideal pH at which they function best. Now, don't write that on the test because that's my first sentence. Do you guys get how I did that? Easy for me because I've done this a thousand times. But that's the kind of first sentence that you're looking for. Everybody catch that? That's what you would do as a summary sentence. So I know that you know that it's a forest and not just a bunch of individual trees. I need a summary. Like if somebody said, hey, what's this a figure of? You wouldn't just say, well, here's pepsin and then here's amylase. And they're like, wait a minute, I asked you what this is a figure showing. You're like, um, shoot, I don't know. If you don't know what this is showing, you don't know the figure and you don't know the process. Does that make sense? I'd also be happy to just take your first sentences whenever you're ready as an email and say, yeah, you absolutely not, you nailed that. And here's another thing that you, sh you guys should know. People who write really good first sentences, generally I don't read the rest of their response very carefully. Now, why do you think that is? Why would I not read the rest of their answers carefully as I should if I hear a really good first sentence? You would think that they'd already know what they're talking about. 
Mm -hmm. It's the number one way that I can tell, do you understand what this is showing? So if you write a really good first sentence and you make the trip up somewhere later on, I probably won't even see it. But if you write a really weak first sentence, I'll be like, oh God, I got to read this whole thing to see if it's worthy of a four or a three. You guys get it? Your most important part of these essays is getting that first sentence wired. Lots of detail, focus on making it sound tight, but detailed and not leaving out any key things. It's really tough, but I can help. I can absolutely help with that. You guys get it? So if this ends up on the test, I'm gonna ask you to tell me overall what it's showing, and then what it's showing at each of the parts. Would it be a good idea to re-explain how the food moves through the GI tract to give me plenty of detail in your answer? Yes. Yes, you can use my examples, just don't use my exact words. I've had students actually try to uh, write every word that I said during a lecture as their essay. Don't do that. And don't copy off the internet. Write in your own words. And if you don't, by the way, what if you look at it and you're like, oh, heck, I can't remember what this is about. What should you do? You have no clue what this is talking about later on. Go back and watch the lecture. Yeah. Could, or who's available to you every Tuesday and Thursday to help you with anything that you don't understand? Ask you. Moi. Okay. So if there's something from the past and you're like, hey, Mr. Sage, I was working on an essay and I just really don't get the pH thing. 99 times out of 100, I'll say, uh, hey, let, let, I'll explain it to you again. I'll give you the whole lecture again, or I can clarify some parts you don't get. I'm here for you. But if you're just like, I don't get enzymes, then I will say you need to watch the video again. But if you give me a pointed question, I'm more, more likely to give you a good, helpful answer rather than just, I don't get it. All right, everybody good with that? All right, off we go. All right, so talking now about enzyme inhibitors. Now, I said that these can either be poisons, which are bad, or a normal part of how enzymes are modulated. And that is to make sure that you're only making as much as you need. And competitive inhibition means that a molecule fits into that little bumpy notch because it's got the same shape. And that turns off the enzyme temporarily or permanently. Temporarily is good, permanently is bad. You guys heard that heavy metals are toxic? Do you guys know why heavy metals are toxic? Because they are, right? <laughs> well, heavy metals are toxic because they interfere with your enzyme. That's what kills you when you eat uh, chromium, too much chromium or lead or whatever. All right, the inhibitor molecule prevents the two sub substrate molecule from getting into the active site. Now, do you think you can cure heavy metal poisoning? Yeah, it's really easy. Just don't listen to the music anymore. Ah, bad dad joke. No, there's actually things called chelating agents. Um, man, that's an old joke. Uh, chelating agents that can actually get in there and pull those uh, heavy metals off of the enzymes, allowing them to work again. So if somebody gets poisoned with heavy metals, you can you can cure them if you, if you have the right material. All right. Cyanide ions competitively block the active side of some enzymes responsible for cellular respiration. That's why cyanide kills you, because it basically stops your enzymes from working um, and you run out of energy. Now, this is not something that you would want to use as a way to regulate your enzymes. This is a poison. And by the way, a lot of other poisons, like poison dart frogs and poisonous mushrooms, have similar kinds of mechanisms often. How does cyanide kill a person? I basically, and this is just to check your understanding. It's, as I said, it blocks the active site of enzymes responsible for cellular respiration and you have no energy left. So what is it called when you have no energy at all left? What are you when you have no energy left in your body? Lethargic. You're a lot more lethargic than that if you have none. You have no ATP, you have no energy in your body at all, none. Dead? You're dead. You're dead. Lethargic means that your energy level is slightly lower than ideal. It doesn't mean you're nearly dead. That's a coma, right? 
But when you're feeling lethargic, it just means you're maybe your 10% your energy levels are 10% less than normal. That makes you feel lethargic. 20% you're going to be unconscious, 30% you're going to be in a coma, and 50% you're dead. You have to have that much energy in your body to stay alive. Anyway. Okay, non-competitive. These are also called allosteric inhibitors. And this is a good example of one that might have two right answers. So if I said, what is an enzyme inhibitor that latches itself to some portion of the enzyme molecule close to the active site? There would be two answers, right? Non-competitive and allosteric because they're synonym. So if this ends up on the test, look for both of these being correct answers. And that doesn't mean put dots on both of them. It means that somewhere in one of the choices, it would say two of these answers are correct. Remember I said when you see that, it should instantly be your default right answer and should only be rejected for good reason, that, that choice. It results in changing of the active site shape. Heavy metals like lead, mercury, and chromium often act as non-competitive inhibitors. Now, these are interesting because many of these, if you get chelating agents in, they can pull these out of the enzymes and you're fine. They used to make pipes out of lead. You guys have heard of the Michigan problems, right? And they used to make, uh, and by the way, do you guys know the, the symbol for lead uh, on the periodic table? Anybody happen to know that one? I'd be really amazed if you guys knew that one. It's PB. It stands for plumbus, which is the Latin for uh, lead. Does plumbus sound like anything that's in your house? Plumbus? Plumbing. plumbing. They used to make plumbing out of lead. Why? Because it was easy to bend and turn into pipes, and it made the water taste sweet. So the, the ancient Romans made their pipes out of lead. And if the water becomes acidic at all, it leaches the lead out, and they think that might have been part of the reason why the Roman Empire fell. But that's where the, the term plumbus or lead PB on the periodic table comes from. So there you go. All right, so here's how competitive inhibitors work. So it fits in, now the substrates can't fit in. But the allosteric or non-competitive inhibitor comes in and look at the enzyme has been deactivated because the shape of the active site has changed. So these are two different ways that you can permanently or temporarily turn off an enzyme. Does that make sense to you guys? Put it in, in a different spot, change the whole thing so it doesn't work anymore, or block it so the substrates can't get in, either one or multiple. There we go. OK, talking about cell metabolism here. Oh, by the way, how many pages do we have left on 4A? One, one page? OK, so please note, as soon as I finish 4A, we're going to jump immediately to 4B, because it's just a continuation of this chapter. Metabolism. Most people believe that metabolism is how fast you burn energy, but that's only one small component of your metabolism. There are two types of metabolic reactions. I think we already talked about endergonic and exergonic, right? Well, exergonic and catabolic go together because energy releasing is generally going to be breaking molecules apart. So catabolic and exergonic go together breaks down large molecules into smaller ones. So you can see that's a very similar definition to exergonic reaction. Anabolic is energy requiring, and that synthesizes small molecules into larger ones. Now, you guys have all heard the term anabolic steroids before, right? Do you guys know what somebody would take anabolic steroids for? Why would anybody take anabolic steroids? Weightlifting? But what are they trying to do? Are, do they just mm -hmm. want to lift weight? Muscle. Muscle. They want to build muscle, right? So look here, taking smaller molecules and making larger ones. So if you want to build your muscle, you have to assemble protein in your muscle. So they're called anabolic steroids because they're steroids that cause the assembling of protein in your muscle cells and make you stronger, bigger and stronger. Okay, so anabolism is buildup catabolism is breakdown. And so remember, anabolic steroids help you build up muscle. By the way, do you guys know why anabolic steroids are illegal in sport? Why do they discourage it? And if they find it, they'll disqualify it. 
Because it gives an unfair advantage. True, but why not just let everyone do it then? If everybody wants to do it, why not just say, hey, do what you want? What's the downside of having people take as many anabolic steroids as they want? It deteriorates health, doesn't it? It deteriorates health, especially mental health. You guys remember that pro wrestler who killed his whole family? A thing called roid rage? Roid rage comes from anabolic steroids. It can actually cause changes to your brain, in mental instability. It can hurt your heart, your testicles, all kinds of things. So that's why anabolic steroids are illegal. Not just because they're an unfair advantage, because they actually sig can significantly harm your health. But you guys know how competition works, right? They just want to win. We'll deal with the consequences of how I won later. But uh, that's generally not what people in charge are supposed to do. All right, feedback inhibition. Now we're going to be talking about this. This is a big part of how physiology works. I want you guys to pay attention to this. Let's take a look at the figure before I give you the rest of the notes. These uh, letters and these boxes represent uh, substrates, molecules that are going to be produced. So if you see here that A, when it hits enzyme one, turns into B. When B hits enzyme two, it turns into C. And when C hits enzyme three, it turns into Z. I don't know why they didn't just go with D, but whatever. Now, look at what happens when Z starts to accumulate. Can you guys see where it's going to go? All you got to do is follow the dashed line. Where does it go? Back here to the beginning. Feed back to the beginning. And so what it says is, hey, we already have plenty of Z. We don't need more. So what Z does is it actually turns off enzyme one and blocks it. Now, question. Does your ice machine use the material it produces to turn itself off? Yes, it does. It has a little arm that checks it. And when the ice is big enough, the arm hits it and says, no more ice, right? And then when you take the amount of ice away, the arm swings down and it turns on your ice machine again. So what do you think happens when the level of Z starts to go down? Let's see if you can guess. It starts making it more. Right. Okay. It means it no longer inhibits the process at the beginning, and it can go on and make it. And that way, you always have just the right amount of Z in your cells, not too much, not too little. So if you have too much, it turns off the system. If you have too little, it turns it on. Same way your thermostat in your house works or an ice machine works. Does that make sense? It's called feedback because it's going from the end and feeding back to the beginning to turn it off. Inhibition means to stop. Okay, the presence of an end product of a series of enzymatic steps causes the process to stop. And this happens a lot in the body. This is a very common way to regulate how fast cellular processes work. The end product acts as an inhibitor to an enzyme early in the sequence. This is a removable inhibitor because when the levels of Z decline, they leave the enzyme and allowing it to continue its work. Okay, that's it for chapter one, uh, chapter four, part one. So what we're going to do is we're going to jump instantly to 4B, and hopefully we'll be done by three o'clock. And by the way, I don't know if I told you for what it's worth, I really appreciate you guys uh, being here for this lecture. Mandy, did I go too fast? Yes, please. Can I get the last sentence? Um, share screen. For, uh, wait a minute. There it is. Is that it? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, I'm done. Thank you. You're welcome. And, uh, See who said that? Desiree? Yes, yeah, very sweet of you. She said, uh, we appreciate you too. I hope that you continue to feel that towards the end of the semester. Um, the burnout will kick in. And if you want to know how that goes, just talk to Sydney. Not that she burned out, but she would know if it was something that was that happened. These this class is not easy and it's a whole lot of work. So if you guys still feel rosy about me in this class at the end, then you're 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 tough. You're tough because it's gonna it's gonna wear you out. Even really good students like Sydney get a little worn down by the end. All right. 
Uh, so here we go. We're going to go on to uh, chapter 4B. There it is. And away we go, 4B. Okay, so now we're going to talk specifically about the process of breaking down sugar to uh, make ATP. Okay. Although energy is stored into the bonds inside of food molecules, this energy is not available to cells for work. Well, you know that we eat food to get energy, right? But we have to convert that food into something that your body can use. Now, here's a little example. If you guys walked into a 7-Eleven with a, pay, a paper paycheck and asked to buy a six pack of beer, what would they tell you? Would they sell it to you and take your paycheck as an exchange? What do you think? Would the cashier take your paycheck as payment for the six pack, just as, as, as if it were cash? No. No. What would they tell you to do? Cash it first and then get the money and then pay. Right, cash the check, right? Mm -hmm. So here's the way that it works. Food molecules that we eat are very much like a paycheck. They represent the possibility of energy, but our bodies can't use them for that. So what we're gonna be talking about today is how our bodies uh, convert. Um, so we, we have four lectures to do this week, right? 4A, 4B, 5, and 7A, right? Okay, so we'll do 5 and 7A on Thursday. Okay, so the idea here is that you've got to break down the food molecules into something that's usable. Uh, and that's, that's really what this process is about. And this process is called cellular respiration. This is the molecule that your body needs to actually do things. You make this by breaking down food molecules, not just in your digestive tract, but in, the, in your cells themselves. ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. Now, this triphosphate is key because it means three phosphates are attached to the adenosine base. Do you guys know how rechargeable batteries work? I mean, not the chemistry, but you know, basically when they're charged up, you put them in the device and they do something, right? Then they go dead. And then what do you got to do? You got to recharge them. I want you guys to think of ATP as kind of like a charged up rechargeable battery. How do you recharge this battery? By eating food, breaking it down. When ATP does work in the cell, just like a rechargeable battery, one of the phosphates comes off, turning it into ADP, or two phosphates. The third phosphate is still around, but it's no longer attached. This is the dead battery. How are we going to get it back to ATP? We've got to break sugar down. That's how we recharge this little battery called ATP. When you break down food in the cells, phosphate, that when it came off, gets reattached. Energy gets stored. And now ATP can do work again. A little mini battery. How good is this system of making ATP? Well, I'll tell you, every living organism does it one way or the other. So it was so effective way back when that every living organism decided to, to mimic it. Uh, if I go too fast, please let me know. No? All right. Overall re equation for cellular respiration. Now, please note, in this particular version of uh, the equation for cellular respiration, there's sixes in front of several of these reactants and products. This is what's called a balanced reaction. If the sixes are missing, it's unbalanced. It's still the correct reaction. It's just unbalanced. So if you see it unbalanced, don't worry. It's still the same thing. So what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be talking about how glucose is broken down inside your cells to release ATP energy so that you can live. By the way, do you guys know why you need to breathe oxygen? What do you think the average person would say if asked, why do you need to breathe oxygen? Doesn't oxygen attach itself to a lot of the free radicals and things and help it get out of your body? Good guess, but it's the opposite. Oxygen uh, generates free radicals and that's bad. Uh, carbs? That's, that's what vitamin C is for. Well, most people would say if they asked, why do you have to breathe oxygen? They'd say to stay alive, right? 
but they don't know why you need oxygen. They just know it's got to be there. By the end of today, you guys should know exactly why you have to breathe oxygen and what it's used for. And there'll actually be an essay on the test asking, do you understand why you need to breathe oxygen? And it makes for a kind of a cool uh, talking point if you're talking to people. It makes you sound really smart. And by the way, when you finish this class, will you be smarter than when you started? Yes, you will, because you will have learned something. Smartness isn't how much you know, it's how much you can learn. Does that make sense? That's what intelligence is, the ability to learn, not just having a whole lot of facts available um, to uh, relate. Okay, so this is how it works. You take glucose, you combine it with oxygen, go through a series of steps, comes out is carbon dioxide, which we breathe out. Water is a byproduct, which is handy. But ATP is the key here. The details of these four arrows is what the rest of this lecture is all about. All right. I still see people writing. Are you trying to fill in the little figure for the equation? All right, moving on. Um, the chemistry beside the behind breaking down sugar. The formula for glucose is C6H12O6. You may have not have seen that before, but it means that there's six carbons, 12 hydrogens, and six oxygens in glucose. When sugar is broken down, the energy in the molecules bonds are converted into ATP. And how that happens is today's rest of today's lecture. The byproducts of the reaction, <coughs> or you could say waste, is carbon dioxide, which comes out when we exhale, and water. Were you guys aware that you're making some water right now in your body just by breathing? You're actually making a little bit of water. Maybe about a thimble full an hour, which is not very much, but you're making a little bit. Do you think a thimble full an hour is enough to drink to keep you alive? No. That's why we drink water as a, as a beverage, right? You guys can't see my Gatorade because it's blocking it. But um, yeah, we, uh, you drink it because you don't make enough by this process. Here's the equation unbalanced. It shows ATP energy as, as, a, fine, as a kind of a side note, but this is the basic uh, equation. So if I asked you to describe this Equation words, this is it. Sugar from your food plus the oxygen that you breathe is converted into the arrow. Carbon dioxide that you breathe out as a waste with water and ATP as the main product. So that's what that equation is saying. If you can translate a chemical reaction into some meaningful words. So the other benefit of Sydney, Tracy, and Mandy having their cameras on is when I see Tracy facing down towards her, her, her paper, I know she's still working. And as long as I see that, I will wait. Does that make sense? So it actually helps me to see you guys taking notes. It'd be a lot easier if we were in a classroom because I could just look out on the whole classroom. But this is the best that I get. If I go too fast, please let me know and I'll go back. Cellular respiration and breathing are closely related. Now, in medicine, respiration means moving air in and out. And in biology, it means how much you burn sugar inside your cells. And they're related. Breathing and respiration are often interchangeable in a medical environment. Ventilation is the more scientific term rather than respiration. But um, ventilation means how much air is moving in and out of a person's lungs. Cellular respiration requires a cell to exchange gases with its surroundings. The surroundings for your cells are the blood. The surroundings for the paramecium is the water in which it lives. Much of this lecture, by the way, came from my general biology class. Because if you look at chapter four in your books, it's not the best. It's not a great chapter. I actually took a whole lot of stuff from a different book and put it into this lecture because I can't, right? Breathing exchanges these gases between the blood and outside air. So if you were a paramecium, you'd be able to exchange the gases directly with the water that you're in. Because we're large organisms, we have to use our lungs and our blood to move all the gases around. It's 
Is anybody still working on this slide? All right, so this is a simple picture showing you how this works. You do cellular respiration in your muscles and other body cells. It releases carbon dioxide, which goes to your lungs, and then you breathe it out. At the same time, you're breathing oxygen in, or alternatingly, you breathe oxygen in, it moves through your blood to your muscle cells, and is used to do cellular respiration. Okay, quick question. The two guys in the upper right are doing one activity, and the two guys in the left or center are doing a different activity. So let's start with the guys in the upper right. What are they doing? Running. Running. Now look at their expressions and their body, their body position. How fast are they running? If you're just looking at them and the blur in the background and their facial expressions and their body. As, as fast as they can run. As fast as they can run. They have nothing left to give because if they hold some back, they'll lose. That's a sprint. You guys ever seen guys like that sprinting? They have muscles because they have to move their arms really fast. They're not running a marathon. And by the way, marathon runners don't look like that, do they? Do you guys know marathon runners are built different than sprinters? Sprinters are almost built like weightlifters because they have to pump their arms so fast to be able to get the momentum they need. Anyway, so they're sprinting. So what are these two guys here doing? And please don't say sleeping, which one student said. Is this guy sleeping? They're resting. Resting, okay. Now. What you're doing right now, is it closer to what these guys are doing or what these guys are doing? Closer to resting. You guys are resting, right? I know it doesn't feel like what you want to do, but you're certainly not going to tell me, Mr. Sage, hold on a second. I need to catch my breath. I just can't, I can't keep up with your lecture. I'm just exhausted. Nobody ever says that because I'm not making you run. By the way, if you've ever been in a class called aerobics and you have to stop to catch your breath, you're not doing aerobics. I'll tell you why here in a second. Okay, so these guys are resting, these guys are sprinting, they're doing two different types of chemical pathways. So anaerobic, guys in the upper right, occurs in the cytoplasm, which is the space between the organelles. Again, I hope you guys have some background into cellular structure, and it doesn't require oxygen, hence the term anaerobic. An means without, aerobic means with oxygen. The process, that process, the portion of the process that we're going to be talking about is called glycolysis or sugar splitting. And I know I'm giving you a lot of new information here. If you haven't gotten this before, if you took my general bio two class, all of this would be very familiar because I teach my general biology students all this detail. By and means without and aerobic means oxygen. So if you're in an aerobics class, are you still breathing? Yes. But the question I have for you up here, these sprinters, how much longer after this picture ta was taken do they have to stop? We have a guess? Uh, probably not that <clears throat> 45 seconds? Not even that, probably 15 or 20 seconds later. How, okay, let me just ask you guys, anybody, any of you here are in any kind of decent shape? Yes. Okay, Denzel. Now, if you go full speed sprinting, how long do you think you can keep that up, Denzel? Oh, probably like 15 seconds. 15 right. seconds. So within about 15 to 20 seconds, these guys got to stop. Is it because they're holding their breath that they have to stop? No. What it means the activity that they're engaging in uses way more energy than you can make using oxygen alone. Does that make sense? So what they end up doing is they end up borrowing energy from themselves later on, kind of like a, a loan shark. You guys know how loan sharks work? I don't make enough money now, or you know, credit cards, which is basically the same thing as a loan shark, right? I don't make enough money now, but I need money, and so I'm going to borrow it and pay it back later. These guys are borrowing energy that they're going to have to pay back later, so it's called anaerobic respiration. They're breathing, but that's not even close to fast enough to allow them to maintain this activity for very long. Sprinting is an anaerobic activity. Now. Pretty soon after they get started, what's, what are they going to feel happening in their muscles? What would you feel if you started sprinting? What, how do your muscles start to feel pretty quickly? Well, tired, yeah, but there's a, when you sprint, there's a particular feeling 
that or lift weights really, really hard. There's a particular feeling that happens in your muscles. Really tight. Yeah, totally. mm -hmm. Burn. It burns. You guys know that feeling of burn? Feel the burn, right? No pain, no gain, that whole thing. The burn comes from the accumulation of lactic acid. So what these guys are doing is they're accumulating lactic acid in their muscles. And it's going to start to burn. What that tells them is if they don't stop soon, their brain's going to make them stop by making them pass out. So if they kept going and didn't stop, they would just pass out. What's the downside? It's a really terrible deal, the same way loan sharking or credit cards are, is you don't get very much and you got to pay back a whole lot. Although I think student loans are even worse because you can't even declare bankruptcy and get rid of student loans. You guys know that I finished uh, my schooling back in 94 and I'm still paying on my student loans? Mm-hmm. Well, I spent a decade not paying. By the way, take my advice. If you get a student loan, don't avoid paying it back because it ends up doubling or tripling. I think mine ended up going five times the normal amount due to penalties and uh, interest. So I'm probably going to be paying it until I'm 70. Or maybe the current administration will just waive all student loans. But uh, rest of my natural life. So when you get a student loan, start paying it. Do something. Get some money going back towards it. All right. Anyway. So they're building up debt and the debt is lactic acid and the lactic acid signals to their brains they're going to have to stop soon. okay aerobic is the opposite this is what these guys are doing what you are doing what i'm doing right now. it happens in the mitochondria which are cellular organelles and requires oxygen now you're getting plenty of oxygen right now because you don't have to stop and rest from this activity they absolutely do there's only one person that can run this fast for hours straight. Anybody know who that is? Come on, aren't you guys Marvel Comics fans? Captain America? Seriously, remember Captain America? He was just sprinting and sprinting and sprinting, but he's not real, is he? He's not a real person. Anyway, back to the notes. Uh, when you rest, you're burning sugar aerobically. So we know we're all doing aerobic respiration. So this is the difference. Okay. There we go. Oh, one more line. The benefit is it's a much better deal. You get a lot more energy out of your sugar that way. But what do you have to have present in order to do it? What's a minimum requirement? Why is it called aerobic? Got to have oxygen. You got to have plenty of it. So you can only do this if your activity level doesn't exceed your ability to deliver oxygen. So for example, you can walk pretty much for hours, right? You could even maybe if you're in good shape, jog for hours, right? How do you know you've switched from aerobic to anaerobic? What sensation do you get? What's the sensation that you get? when you switched from aerobic to anaerobic. Like today, when I was at the gym, I was lifting weights, no pain at all. Then all of a sudden I started to feel something that said, I'm almost done. What did I feel? The burn. The burn. Right, when the lactic acid starts kicking in, that's a way of saying, hey, you're almost done and you're gonna have to stop soon. Now, depending on how hard you're working, how fast you're working, it says how soon you're gonna have to stop. Um, I was just past the threshold, so I was able to get maybe five or six or seven more reps after that. But um, if you're doing really heavy reps, when you feel that burn, usually you only get one or two more. These guys only get a few more seconds. Too. All right. By the way, when you see this term fermentation, it means anaerobic respiration. You might want to write that down. Fermentation here in this bullet means anaerobic respiration. So in human muscle cells, which we were just talking about with the sprinters. So they have about enough ATP to support activities such as quick sprinting for five seconds. When Denzel mentioned it, he said he could sprint for 15 seconds. So that means that five seconds into it, he ran out of ATP. So how's he going to keep going if he's out of ATP after about five seconds? Well, 
there's a way to cheat. Your body has this way to cheat. And what it does is it keeps this chemical called creatine phosphate around. And by the way, some weightlifters use creatine to get more reps, more exercise out before they start to feel the burn. There's another 10 seconds. So now there's 15 seconds. So if you're in pretty good shape, what are you going to start to feel after those 15 seconds of sprinting? What do you feel? Fermentation. So what's going to start generating the burn feel? What's the chemical that your muscles make when you're sprinting? Lactic acid. Lactic acid, very good. By the way, please note that lactic acid and lactate are the same thing. When you see that tate ending, it's the same thing as saying ic acid. So lactate and lactic acid are the same. The product of lactic acid or lactate is fermentation in humans and other mammals. Now, some creatures like yeast, they don't make lactic acid, they make alcohol, which is good for us, right? That's how beer and wine is made. We let some organisms make alcohol as their anaerobic product rather than lactic acid, because lactic acid is no good to drink. It doesn't taste good at all. Okay, lactic acid is how we do anaerobic respiration. But some microorganisms, especially yeast, they do it differently. They don't do the same pathway. And this is one of your review questions, by the way. Is this the two parts of beer that make it fun to drink? You guys ever had a flat beer? Nasty. You ever had an ear beer? Nasty, right? So the alcohol and the CO2 both contribute to the pleasantness of drinking a bubbly beverage that's alcoholic, right? And by the way, wine, regular wine doesn't have the bubbles because they allow it to escape as it's fermenting. Uh, beer is not allowed, the CO2 is not allowed to escape, and that's actually part of what kills the yeast and stops the fermentation process. But uh, the yeast in wine is killed by the alcohol that produces it. It produces not the CO2. As the CO2 accumulates, so does the acidity, and that kills the yeast. So that's why when you let beer get to about 3% alcohol, it stops because it kills what was making the alcohol. You guys ever heard of malt liquor? Colt 45? What they do is they take regular beer and they just add pure ethanol to it. So that's more higher octane. But you can't get beer much higher than about 3% um, and wine the same because at that level, the alcohol uh, actually kills the organisms that produce it. It's a, it's a poison. Okay, now. Uh, this figure may be an extra credit on, an, on your first test. Well, what I would ask you to do if it ended up as extra credit is to describe this overall and then step by step. It may or may not be filled in. I think that the figure that you have is not filled in, correct? By the way, what Mandy's doing is taking a picture is great. There's no problem with that at all. If you want to have a picture of it. Where's my cell phone, she says. Which is like one of the worst feelings in the world, by the way. Have you guys ever noticed that? Where's my cell phone is like the thing you really don't want to don't want to have to consider. Anyway, remember, Tracy, you can watch this again later on. So it's basically saying, could you describe this entire process? Now, we haven't gotten through this yet, but this is okay, if I ask. Sorry. If, if I ask you, you're going to you're going to want to summarize the whole thing and then go through a step at a time. By the end of today, you will, you will be able to do that. This, at best, would be an extra credit uh, assignment. But I got to move on. So uh, you guys can go back and rewatch that or take pictures when you rewatch it, whatever. All right, first step. We're running out of time. Glycolysis takes place in the cytoplasm. This is the space, the gooey stuff between organelles. I said that earlier. So what happens? Since glucose has six carbons, it's broken in half, basically split right down the middle into two molecules called pyruvate. Now, 
given what I told you about uh, lactic acid, can you guys tell me what another name for pyruvate is? I'd be impressed. Pyruvic acid. Very good. Pyruvic acid. Well done. So pyruvic acid and pyruvate are the same in the same way that lactate and lactic acid are the same. So you may see pyruvic acid later in the notes. Please note it's the same thing. It's written a different way. Okay, when you break this molecule apart, as in with many reactions, when you break things apart, you release energy, you get directly two ATP molecules are produced. And this is the main ATP that comes as a result of anaerobic respiration. Now, you guys remember the very first picture that I showed you in this chapter? Do you guys remember what the first slide had on it? Anybody remember what was on that first slide? No? It was, a dude with a, it was a dude holding a wheelbarrow, right? Oh. Okay, so what do wheelbarrows do? Everybody knows this one. What do wheelbarrows do? They carry or have your loads to another area for you. Right, right. They carry stuff from one place to another. So how do you use a wheelbarrow? Where you take it over to where you, need, where you need to fill stuff up, right? You fill up the wheelbarrow, you move it to where it's going to be dumped. You dump your stuff, and then what do you do with the wheelbarrow if the job's not done? Take it back and load it up again. Yeah, and then you repeat the process, okay? You guys with me on that? It's what a wheelbarrow is, and that's why I had it at the beginning of the lecture. These molecules here, NAD, see this portion NAD? That's the wheelbarrow. The hydrogen is its uh, load. So it's basically just a shuttle for hydrogens and, ener and uh, high energy electrons, electrons to go from one part of the cell to another. It's a wheelbarrow. So try to remember that analogy. It'll help you explain it. And you can use the analogy of a wheelbarrow to help you explain it. And it will be for sure an essay on the first test. All right, oxygen isn't needed here. So it's called the anaerobic portion. Now, even aerobic respiration starts out in the anaerobic form. It's only when you don't have oxygen, do you stop the process. Anybody need a moment more with this slide? Tracy, that's good. Okay, so you guys think you could memorize all this? Yeah, you could, but I'm not gonna make you. I'm not going to do that. I actually knew an instructor who would have the students draw this entire thing out and explain every step. How important is that? Not important at all. But in remember the, that picture I said could be extra credit? If you want to know what's happening in that arrow right there, this is it. This is what's happening. But the key, I just want to tell you some key things here. Um, let me show you some key things that are happening. Notice here we have... ATP turning into ADP, which means that you're actually investing energy. You're actually taking the charged battery and putting energy in. There's that phosphate. And you do it again. Now you put two phosphates in and you break it apart. But here's a key thing. here. There's that wheelbarrow full of hydrogens that's going to be used later on in the process. So this is going to leave and go somewhere else. But look, later on in the process, you get ATP out here and here. This whole thing happens twice. You guys see how it's split into two different things here? So you get two ATPs times two gives you how much? Two times two is four. Do you guys know what net and gross are? Net pay and gross pay? Gross pay is all the money that your employer has to shell out on your behalf, and net pay is how much you get. The difference is how much is in taxes and whatever else they take out of your paycheck, right? So if it costs two at the beginning and you get four out at the end, what's your net take of ATP? You get four, but it costs two. What's the net ATP? Well, let me put it a different way. I sell this object for $10, but it costs me eight to buy it. What was my profit? Two. Two. Okay, so my total get, what I get out of this is four, but it cost me two at the beginning. So what's my profit? Two. Two. 
So that's why they say two are made because it costs two at the beginning and you get two times two, which is four out of it, meaning you get a net of two. Does that make sense? It takes money to make money. You have to spend money to buy stuff so you can sell it and make the money back plus some, right? The body does the same thing. All right. This, the next process that we're talking about is called the Krebs cycle, sometimes called the citric acid cycle. And I will explain to you why it's called the citric acid cycle. In the Krebs cycle, the pyruvic acid that came from glycolysis earlier on is prepped into a usable form called acetyl-CoA. The pyruvate or pyruvic acid enters the mitochondria. Some of this won't make sense until you see it. You won't remember most of this, but I want to see, can you get your thought process together? And can you remember some of these things? Okay, citric acid cycle. So what happens as you're going through this cycle? Well, the original carbons that came in from the food have to be removed because without removing them, you can't release the energy. So when you take off a carbon dioxide, that represents some of the energy that was in that original molecule, and then it leaves. How do you get rid of the CO2 that's made here? What process do we use to get rid of it? Breathing out. Right, we breathe it out. So all these carbons that we took in in our food get, leave us in the form of exhaling. So it's kind of a cool little, Side note, there's that wheelbarrow full of hydrogens. The acetyl-CoA attaches to a four carbon molecule making a new six carbon molecule. The six carbon molecule that's formed right here is called citric acid. And so that's why this process is called the citric acid cycle because it's the main molecule that begins the process. Clip off another carbon dioxide. This releases more energy. Now you get a five carbon molecule. Notice I didn't tell you the names of them, right? Because you don't need to know, you don't care, and you'll never remember. There's our another wheelbarrow full of hydrogen. It's gonna go on to the end process. One more time, you get rid of another carbon dioxide. Now all the carbons are gone. that came in in the original sugar. Another full wheelbarrow. These wheelbarrows, one, two, three, and then one from earlier on are gonna go to the end process that that's, that's actually gonna make the energy. You get a little side ATP here. It's like a little bonus. Like if your paycheck is $500 and they give you 20 bucks as a bonus, is that really significant or just kind of like a little nice little tip? I'm getting tired. My questions aren't making as much sense as I was hoping. The point I'm trying to make is this ATP is not the point of the Krebs cycle or citric acid cycle. It's these wheelbarrows. Can you guys catch that? NAD formation is the point of this cycle. This ATP here is a little bonus, just a little bit of extra ATP to help out. Okay, we make one more wheelbarrow full. Here's what's called a double wheelbarrow. It's called FADH2. So it's carrying two hydrogens instead of one. And the four carbon molecule that came in over here gets recycled back to the beginning. So basically you have this molecule coming in, it's going through this process, carbons are being popped off of there and energy is being moved from that molecule into these hydrogen carriers and a little bit of ATP. Okay, so the key is the formation of these wheelbarrows full of hydrogen. NAD is the wheelbarrow, hydrogen is its payload. Okay. That's how the process works so far. We may go a little past three, I do apologize. You guys have to not do something at three that you were hoping to do. Okay, so notice I'm not gonna ask you to know this whole process, but I am gonna ask you to note visually what I just said in the notes. Remember I talked about filling up wheelbarrows, right? So here's what's coming in from uh, glycolysis. And there's your four carbon molecule and it forms a thing called citrate. What's another word for citrate? Citric acid. 
Right, that's why it's called the citric acid cycle, citrate. So check out what happens, it changes to isocitrate, but here's the key. This is what I want you guys to catch. <clears throat> As these carbon dioxides we breathe out are being clipped off, the energy from that, see how these are all together? You clip that off, a little energy is released that ends up in here. Now notice this NAD has like a sunburst shape around it, right? That means it's got energy, not just hydrogen, but energy. The energy comes in the form of a high energy electron. So not only is this wheelbarrow holding hydrogens, it's also holding energy. Okay, then you form this. Notice another carbon dioxide gets clipped off. We're able to fill up another wheelbarrow with hydrogens and energy. Then down here at the bottom, a complex process happens. You get a little ATP right there. Then you've removed, at this point, you've removed all of the, yeah, you've removed all the carbon dioxide, but it's still energized enough. So you can fill up this wheelbarrow and this wheelbarrow. And then eventually when you've filled up the last wheelbarrow, this molecule, how you started, rotates back to the beginning. Another one of these comes in and you start the process over and over. It's like a little, little machine. The key here is this is why we breathe out carbon dioxide because you're making it here. And these are going to go towards the last step called electron transport to actually make us energy. Does that make sense, guys? I'm not going to ask you to memorize all the details, just what's going on with the energy. All right, ETS. Now, this is the very end of our lecture. Most of the ATP a cell makes is in ETS. And so far, this has been a very complicated process, right? We had to break it down. We had to go through the cycle. We had to fill up these wheelbarrows. But it's all going to come together here in a place called ETS, sometimes called electron transport chain. Okay, there's that. Those are the full wheelbarrows here and here, two different types. They reach the ETS and dump the hydrogens that they are carrying. Now, do you guys remember what I said? Those wheelbarrows are carrying besides hydrogens. What else is in there that gave it that sunburst shape? ATP? Close. What is in? What is in here that gives it that sunburst shape if it's not the hydrogen? Anybody remember what I said? I said a lot. Energy? Energy in the form of a high energy electron. You guys remember that? An electron has energy. That's why it has that shape. So carrying hydrogens and high energy electrons. Okay, so not only does it drop off the hydrogen, it drops off the electrons. Now, do you guys know what electricity is? You say I have electricity in my house. What is that? You're like, Mr. Sage, you're asking us way too many science questions. Electricity is the ability for electrons to move through a wire and be worked. Does that make sense? You plug in your vacuum, it allows electrons to go through the wire, through your vacuum to do the work of vacuuming your floor. So what we're going to see is that these high energy electrons are going to have energy to do the work that we actually want to do. And it gets a lot more complicated from here on out. Don't let your eyes roll back in your head. Okay, when this happens, the electrons that were in there move through a chain in the same way that electrons move through a wire inside your vacuum tube or a water pump. Really, a water pump is going to make more sense. And, and I'll tell you why water pump is the better analogy here in just a second. Now, when electricity moves through a pump, it allows something to happen. Right? You can pump water, or you can pump hydrogens. The moving electrons cause hydrogens to be pumped through the membrane against the gradient. Now, we haven't talked about uh, diffusion or active transport or any of that stuff. And you're going to get a lot of that in the very first Physio X. But the idea is that if you put a whole bunch of stuff on one side. OK, let me give you an analogy that might help. You guys ever seen those cartoons where somebody is sticking a whole bunch of stuff in a closet and they have to shut the door really quick or it'll fall out? What happens when you open the door and leave it open? It all comes flying. All the stuff comes tumbling out, right? But is it possible to have a closet that's already full of stuff if you Open the door really quick and shove another one in to shut it really quick. Can you add one more to it? Yeah, but it takes energy, right? You got to be quick. You got to shove it in there really hard. So the idea is you're trying to pump uh, hydrogens, which are basically hydrogen ions, which are uh, protons, 
the way that they don't want to go because they're already packed in this place. They don't want to go that way. It's like trying to put people back on an elevator. They want to get off the elevator, right? But you can do it if you shove them back into the elevator. Anyway, so these are my analogies. So as the hydrogens then who have been shoved onto this other side of the membrane are allowed to come back through, that's when you make ATP. And it works very much like a water wheel. I don't know if you guys know how water wheels work. As the water dribbles through those big wheels, it causes something inside to move. You need to generate electricity or grind wheat or whatever you want to do. I'm going to describe, I'll show you all of what I'm telling you in a picture. Hopefully it'll make a little bit more sense. So remember I told you I would tell you later on why we have to have oxygen in our bodies? There it is. Oxygen represents the other side of the battery. And I'll tell you what I mean by the other side of the battery. Now, have you guys ever put a battery into a device, let's say a remote control, but you only have one in touching the metal? Does it work? Do you guys know why you have to have both ends of the battery touching? Anybody have a guess? So that the energy can flow all the way through it? Yeah, the electrons come out of the battery on the negative side. They go through your remote and then they have to get back to the battery and find somewhere to, to, to land, right? And attach to something. That's why you have to have both sides touching. When you have electrons in here that are moving through a wire in your mitochondria, they have to have somewhere to go, like the positive end of the battery. Does that make sense? If they have nowhere to go, they can't keep flowing. You can't have electricity going through a device unless they has somewhere to end up. And here's the key, you guys. The oxygen is that positive side of the battery, a place for the electrons to go so they can continue to flow and make ATP. So if you don't have oxygen, you have nowhere for those electrons to end up. Now, the key is the, electron, uh, the oxygen can't hold the electrons by itself. It has to combine with hydrogens, which happen to be all over the place. And it makes water. This is why we make water when we're breathing is because the oxygen is the place where the electrons go at the end so that the process can continue. And this is why you die when you don't get oxygen, because if there's nothing to grab a hold of those electrons, they can't keep flowing, you can't keep pumping hydrogens, you don't make ATP. And if you have no ATP, you are what? Dead. 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 OK, so we're going to see the dead symbol coming up on the figure in a second. And this is why you have to breathe oxygen because it re represents the place where electrons go. It's called the final electron acceptor because it allows the system to keep going for you to make more energy. The key to this whole thing now is now you have ATPs, now you can do stuff like whatever, move, think, anything you want to do, you got to have ATP. And I believe, is that too fast? All right. I believe this next figure is more or less the end of our lecture. Isn't that correct? Yeah, this figure is more or less the end of the, the lecture. So as soon as I get done explaining this to you, uh, that's it. We we'll call it a day. And I know it's been a long one, two hours. Uh, but I would say this class is way more entertaining than a movie, wouldn't you say? But I'm, I'm trying to make it as entertaining as I can. I don't have a cape and I don't have a glove or anything like that. But anyway, uh, hopefully you guys aren't totally bored by this. If you guys get totally bored by my lectures, I have absolutely failed. If you think I have a dorky, awful sense of humor, well, crap happens. But at least I didn't bore you to death. All right, this is it. This is a figure that you're going to get on the test. And I'm going to ask you first to tell me, summarize it in one sentence, which is really tough. But then tell me what happens step by step and that it shows you what's happening. Here. Unfortunately, this is not really, this is not at all what I want. Don't give me this, okay? Give me what I tell you, not what this says. But it does basically show you what's happening at each of these numbers. So let's start with this. Okay, way up here at citric acid cycle, do you guys remember that the whole point of the citric acid cycle was to make these wheelbarrows full of hydrogens and high energy electrons. Do you guys remember me telling you that? 
the purpose of this is to have NADH and FADH2 to come here and do their work. Okay, so they come in here. So they have to drop off two things. They have to drop off this hydrogen here, or any of these hydrogens here, and it has to drop off electrons. So the hydrogens just kind of go into this pool right here, and the electrons go through this red line. You guys see the red arrows? That's electrons moving through a wire. Now notice that the red starts to fade as the electron loses energy because it's been pumping stuff the way that it doesn't want to go. Now, notice here, this area here is a darker blue than this. Why are they making this area darker? Because it shows there's already more hydrogen ions, or protons, which is the same thing, here than here. Now, normally, when there's a whole bunch of stuff in one place and less in another, where it's crowded is going to spread out to the area where it's less crowded. It's called diffusion. But because you're adding energy in the form of an electron here, you're able to continue to push these the way they don't want to go, from where there's less to where there's more. You're shoving these people back onto the elevator. You're putting more toys in the crowded closet. But this is for a good reason. So as these electrons move, the hydrogens that they just dropped off, these wheelbarrows that just dropped off the hydrogens, get pushed this way into the area where there's already more of them. And it does it again here. And it does it again here. And at this point, it's run out of energy. But in the same way that you have to touch the other side of the battery, these electrons have to find somewhere to go so that more can follow behind them and do this job. So where do they go? These electrons find some oxygen and find some of these hydrogens that were just kind of floating around in here that were dropped off, right? And they make water. So the oxygen that you breathe is the oxygen part of the water that you make. And the hydrogens came in all the way back from the beginning that were formed from these wheelbarrows. And this is some water that you make every day. Okay, so this is where, so that's why they say oxygen acts as the final electron acceptor of ETS because it's the last place electrons go so that more can follow behind them and do this key pumping process. What are they pumping? Hydrogen ions into this little intermembrane space that's really, really full of hydrogens. You guys with me so far? All right, now you have tons of hydrogen in here. What are you going to do with it? You're going to form a water wheel. And this water wheel is called ATP synthase. Remember me telling you that enzymes often end with ASC? If it's ATP synthase, it means it's an enzyme, ASC, that synthesizes ATP. So how does it work? Well, as the hydrogens flow through it, it causes it to rotate just like a wheel. When this thing starts rotating like a wheel, that mechanical energy actually converts this discharge battery back into ATP. And this is the end product of all of it. So do you guys see why the electrons have to keep flowing? Because you got to make plenty of this stuff. You have to make this in high concentration so that when it flows back through, it's like why water has to be up on a hill. Because when it flows through this little water wheel called ATP synthase, which means an enzyme synthesizes ATP, it turns and this molecule that you've used up from flexing your muscle can be recharged into this molecule. And there it is there. Now, let me see if you guys can get it. The NAD and the FAD molecules, where do you think they're going to go after they drop off their payload? Remember, what, what do they say they're like? Like, what tool are they like? Like a wheelbarrow. Wheelbarrow. What happens to wheelbarrows when they dump their stuff out? They go back and get more. So where did they where do they have to go back to? The citric acid cycle. So they head right back to the citric acid cycle, pick up more hydrogens and electrons. So where did the hydrogens come from? That's from the sugar that you ate way at the beginning of the process. Because remember, sugar is made of carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen. Well, we got rid of the carbons and the oxygens as CO2, you breathe them out. All that's left is hydrogens, and 
There they are. That's the hydrogen that was left over in the sugar. Where does it end up? In the water and you pee it out. It's all accounted for. But the key is you got to make a whole lot of this by pumping, moving electrons through, pumping hydrogens, and then the hydrogens flow back through rotation, formation of ATP. Does that make sense? And ATP has plenty of energy because you can see the sunburst shape. This is challenging stuff. I get it. It's very difficult to explain. If you guys can explain this, you can explain them. This is one of the more challenging uh, ones I give you in the semester because it's so internal and it's so kind of abstract in some ways. It's happening inside your cells, but you can't see it. You can't feel it. But you do know you have to breathe oxygen because it is a place for the electrons to go. All right, any questions about this one? I do recommend rewatching this lecture because I was going through it fairly quickly. Picking up what I say, please don't give me any of the stuff from the bottom. Uh, if I see any of the stuff from the bottom here, I will mark you down seriously. This is not your essay. This is just to kind of explain it. Don't say, ooh, I'm going to take what it says here and just kind of massage it a little bit to make it sound like mine. I will know. Don't do it. Use more my words, not word for word, but what I explain. Can you use analogies like wheelbarrows and and uh, batteries and pumps and all that stuff. Yeah, I throw all that stuff in there. Just don't copy out of the book and don't copy online. Like, oh, electron transport. I bet there's a good Wikipedia page on that. I'll just copy and paste that in. You will absolutely fail this class if that's your strategy. I'm not even going to mince words. Don't do it. My general biology students try to do that all the time and they fail. If you don't understand it, what should you do? If later on you're going to write this essay, you don't get it, what do you do? Ask you. Ask me, and I will explain the whole thing to you again. Maybe it would be good to watch this part of the lecture again, just to double, just to kind of restate it. Now, the reason why it's so important to rewatch this, guys, is because when you go to ask me questions, you want to have pointed questions. Like, see this part right here, Mr. Sage? I don't get this part. So you don't end up saying to me, hey, I don't get uh, ETS. And I'll say, what part of it don't you get? And you'll say any of it. Well, that means you didn't rewatch the video, right? You don't know what part you don't get. So try to be as specific as possible with your questions, and I will have better answers for you if, uh, if you give me good questions. Does that make sense? But that doesn't mean be afraid to ask. It just means do a little work in advance, and then I'll be able to help you better if you uh, are prepared for uh, asking me the question. OK, is that it for the whole chapter? Yes, it is. OK, so anybody have a guess what they would say for the first sentence on this? This is a tough one, right? Okay, here's one that you could say, but you won't because it's my first sentence. This figure shows how high energy electrons delivered from the citric acid cycle are used to pump protons, which are eventually used to create ATP. And the electrons are used to create water uh, as a result of combining with oxygen. Now, that wasn't even that great because I just did it right off the top of my but it wasn't a run on and hit some of the key concepts, right? That's the kind of first sentence that I'm gonna be looking for for you, but not that one, because that's mine. <clears throat> but that's how you do it. It's easy for me. Now, will I help you write your first sentence if you come to office hours? What do you think, Tracy, will I help you? Yeah, I think you'll help us with trying to get our thoughts together to get it. Right, especially if you come to me with something I'll say, okay, well, let's take a look at the picture. What else is happening in this picture that you didn't mention in your first sentence? And you'd be like, oh, wait a minute. Let me, let me rewrite this and, and, then, and, then, and then I'll read it to you. And you tell me if I got it. Isn't it helpful sometimes to be like uh, working on it while someone's there and then they give you some input and you fix it up a little bit and run it back by them? I don't mind doing that for anybody who wants to do office hours. And remember, office hours are always right at the end of the lecture. Does that make sense to you guys? So I'd be happy. Any one of you guys who wants me to re-explain any part of it or look at your first sentence, look at your whole essay or any of that, I guarantee this is one of the essays and it's going to kick your butt if you don't get started with it in the next three or four days. And I just lectured on it. And I know you're feeling a little overwhelmed, but um, that means you're paying attention. 
if you're like, oh, this is easy, no sweat, I can get through this, no sweat at all, then you are not paying attention because this is hard. But I, I'm here to help you if you need. I, I, I will give you whatever help I can this week. So that is chapter four in a very large nutshell. Does anybody have any questions about what we just covered? Um, I know it's probably you guys are like feeling so overwhelmed. You're not even sure what questions to ask at this point. And I get that too. Uh, but is there anything about like, we just met today, many of you. Uh, is there anything that I covered in terms of class policies or any, any of that stuff that you're like, eh. so you can ask about that. Now you can also bring it up on Thursday. Remember we're meeting again, same time, one o'clock. Um, it's a different link, by the way. The, the link is at the bottom of the Start Here page. It's under the Thursday. If you go to the Tuesday link, it, it will be the wrong one because it's it's not Tuesday, it's Thursday. Uh, and then remember at the end of any one of my lectures, if you want to stick around and talk about anything, even if it's not directly related to the class, you just want to have someone to talk to, uh, I can do that for you as well. Would anybody like to stick around after uh, I turn off the recording, talk about some personal issues that you think might I might want to know. No? I'll stick, up, I'll stick around because I uh, came late and I do apologize. Uh oh, Misha, you locked up. Because I just saw that you gave me the ad code to get in. I'm sorry, what happened? Uh, your, your video locked for a second. I didn't hear you. But yeah, why don't you just stick around when everybody else leaves and, and I'll turn off the recording and we'll, we'll talk. Okay, just okay. as if you were in my office. Um, uh, Lucas asks, so the Krebs cycle produces four NAD and one FADH2. That's correct, Lucas. Is he still here? Yes, he is. Okay. I'm sorry, I missed your uh, your question earlier. I was powering ahead. Um, anybody else want to stick around and chat besides Misha? So what happens in the situation where there's two people, I would say, um, Tracy, if you want to stick around, I'm going to move you into the uh, waiting room. And then uh, when I'm done with Misha, I'll invite you back in. And that way, her stuff stays private okay and if you don't care about it being private then both of you guys can be in the office together but generally i don't do that so uh misha you're going to stick around the rest of you guys thank you for coming and uh work on review questions get started with physio x and i'll hope to see you guys back here on thursday thank you you're welcome stick around misha <laughs>